Good morning and uh, welcome to the uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, this morning, the Select Committee is meeting to assess the present state of the coal industry and to explore how coal can continue to play a role in a new energy age. Coal was mined in this country before it even was a country. The first 13 states appeared on a United States flag after coal mines appeared on our maps. Coal has helped power America for nearly 300 years. And just like millions of other American families over the years, the Markies had a close personal relationship with coal. After my grandfather got off the boat from Ireland in 1902, he got a job hauling coal for the Lock Coal Company in Malden, Massachusetts for the next 30 years. And when I was a boy, I spent many cold winter mornings shoveling coal into our furnace at home. Much has changed since those days. We are entering a new energy age, an age in which technology is making it possible to harness energy from the wind, the sun, the atom, shale gases, and efficiency measures. Today, many Americans are asking if coal is safe enough, if coal is healthy enough, and if coal is innovative enough to be part of our shared clean energy future. Nine days ago, in the upper Big Branch mine in West Virginia, 29 miners lost their lives. The incident reminds us that mining coal is a dangerous job performed by courageous people. We owe it to the fallen miners and their families to take a harder look at the entire structure of mining safety. And today, our prayers go out to the families of those who lost their lives and to all, all coal miners. The public is also concerned about how safe the mining and burning of coal is for our environment and for our health. From the effects of mountaintop removal to air pollution that causes asthma and other health effects to mercury levels that spike near coal-fired power plants and catastrophic releases of fly ash, coal faces a myriad of environmental challenges. And finally, the burning of coal also releases carbon dioxide, which traps heat and is causing the Earth's temperature to rise. Climate change is a serious problem, and yet some in the coal industry deny that the problem of global warming even exists and have contributed to organizations that spread doubts about science and policy. That has led many to believe the industry is not committed to finding a solution to our pollution problems. Meanwhile, the challenges from coal's competition are growing. Last year, coal's share, uh, coal share of America's electricity generation dropped from 49% uh, uh, to 44% due to increased competition and decreased demand. In 2009, 40% of all new electricity capacity built was from wind, roughly the same as natural gas. Meanwhile, no new coal plants broke ground. While the rest of the energy world is already moving to a lower carbon future, people wonder whether the coal industry is stuck in another time. When Henry Waxman and I were crafting the Waxman-Markey bill that passed the House last June, we worked with several members from coal states to better understand the challenges faced by the coal industry and how to respond to those challenges. That's why we dedicated $60 billion in assistance to the coal industry to help design and build the carbon capture and sequestration plants the industry so desperately needs. And so the question on the future of the coal industry is whether the coal industry and coal burning utilities will embrace innovation or stand pat and fight change. We have seen this before. The American automotive manufacturers successfully resisted new fuel economy standards, claiming that the technology to turn gas guzzlers to fuel sippers was neither available, affordable, nor preferable. And eventually, the folly of their strategy of delay became clear. Consumers abandoned their products, and two of the three major American automotive companies received a U.S. government bailout in order to survive. Today, with the future of the coal industry in your hands, I challenge you to join us in charting a new path forward to prevent a perilous outcome 
for your industry and for the planet. And I ask that you cease efforts to deny the science of global warming and to stop spending millions of dollars uh, in misleading the public as to the true science behind climate change. I ask that you embrace the provisions of the Waxman-Markey bill that uh, light the way to, uh, for your uh, industry in the years ahead and that they provide your industry with the billions of dollars of financial assistance to help transition to a low carbon economy. I believe that there is a successful future ahead for the coal industry centered on safer and cleaner practices uh, for your fuel, for your workers, and for the earth. I look forward uh, to uh, your testimony, and I thank you for coming. Let me now turn and recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like most Americans, I believe that there can and should be a proper balance between economic prosperity and environmental sustainability. Everyone wants clean air and clean water, and no one wants a sky-high electric and tax bill. But cap and tax programs don't come close to striking this balance. The huge reliance on offset means that emissions will merely shift overseas, and every study has shown that cap and tax will cause increases in utility rates, gas prices, and other economically essential activities. One statistic from the National Association of Manufacturers demonstrates the greatest danger of cap and tax, three to four million lost jobs. This is not the balance the American people are demanding, especially when nearly 15 million Americans are unemployed. Coal is the most abundant energy resource in the United States, and it generates nearly half of our country's electricity. Coal power plants built today emit 90 percent fewer pollutants like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and mercury than plants built in the 70s. Emissions from coal power plants have dropped 40 percent since the 70s, despite the fact that coal use has tripled, and the United States has nearly one-third of the world's total coal. Last week, the World Bank approved funding for a new coal-fired power plant in South Africa. There was heavy criticism from some environmentalists about this project, but the World Bank officials said that the benefits clearly outweighed the concerns. Faced with frequent blackouts and an aging infrastructure, the South African government said that the energy reliability of the plant would lift the economy and the standard of living for South Africans. The U.S. Treasury Department also noticed that there were no near-term viable low-carbon energy alternatives for South Africa. Coal is the only resource that could possibly keep this nation's economy on track. Despite this realization, the United States abstained from the World Bank vote. China is the world's biggest user of coal, burning nearly three times more than the U.S. China is also the world's largest emitter of carbon dioxide, but China is not willing to commit to an international agreement to cut CO2 emissions. The administration is trying to sell cap and tax on the false premise that it will create so-called green jobs. The President is correct when he says that his proposal to impose higher energy prices on American manufacturers will create jobs, but those jobs won't be green. However, they'll be red. As China's reliance on coal continues to grow with a surging economy, cap and tax will kill United States manufacturing and ship even more of our precious jobs to China. It's neither advantageous nor possible to abandon coal, but that's precisely what cap and tax proposes to do. The policy is proof that President Obama intends to make good on his campaign promise when he said, quote, if someone wants to build a coal-fired power plant, they can. It's just going to bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that greenhouse gas that's being emitted, unquote. At least for the foreseeable future, the world cannot meet its energy demands without coal. But the new technology can help lessen the environmental impacts of coal use. Researchers continue to advance carbon capture and storage technology, which holds the potential to drastically cut CO2 emissions from coal use. The test project at the Wee Energy's power plant in Ple Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, last year successfully captured 90 percent of carbon dioxide emissions. As we speak, groundbreaking will begin on another test project in Bucks, Alabama. The 25-megawatt Berry power plant is expected to capture between 100,000 and 150,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide per year. 
The CO2 will be transported by pipeline to a site about 10 miles away where it will be injected for permanent underground storage in a deep saline geologic formation. This project will attempt to demonstrate start to finish carbon capture and storage and is one of the most important test projects underway that will advance development of this critical technology. And while carbon capture is part of the energy balance Americans demand, so are proven technologies like nuclear power and renewable technologies like wind and solar. Americans want a healthy mix of energy technologies that keep the environment clean and the economy humming. And that's why Republicans have always supported an all of the above approach to energy. I would like to welcome our witnesses today and I look forward to the testimony of Ohio Coal Association President Mike Carey, who will tell us more about the importance of coal in his state and for our country about what and about President Obama's war against coal. Uh, I have to apologize for leaving this hearing, but the Constitution Subcommittee, uh, which I'm also the ranking member of, starts at 10 o'clock. So I'll read the testimony and uh, I'll help defend the Constitution in the meanwhile. So thank you. We thank the gentleman very much. Um, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Thank, thank you. Uh, um, I really appreciate the leadership being here in this industry. I just want to note three headlines that are in the papers in the last week. One, uh, two days ago, uh, a glacier collapsed in Peru, crashed into a lake, caused a tsunami, destroyed 20 homes and injured 50 people. A third of the glaciers in Peru, Alp, the, um, in the Andes, have now disappeared because of climate change. Second uh, headline, uh, two more glaciers disappeared in Glacier National Park. Glacier National Park will be glacier free within the century if climate change continues unabated. Third headline, 29, uh, Miners lost their lives in the Upper Big Branch mine in, in West Virginia. And I think those three stories have something in common, which are the, the costs of coal without sequestering carbon dioxide. And I want to note, I appreciate these leaders be here, uh, being here because I want to note another uh, person in the coal industry, Mr. Don Blankenship, who I understood said something to the effect that safety regulators are, quote, as, or safety regulators uh, intent to think they're going to protect the safety of miners is, quote, as silly as global warming, close quote. And a lot of people have lampooned that statement, but it's actually very true. Mine safety is as silly as global warming. They are both deadly serious and they're not silly at all. And we have some leaders here, if you decide to join with us to try to find a way to have a policy that will allow coal to be burned in a way that does not put massive amounts of CO2, does not treat the atmosphere as a garbage dump, that in fact buries it underground. If you will support those efforts, this, if you will take this lifeline that we have now sent the industry in this bill by sending you billions of dollars to support that research and development, coal can have a, a future. And if you don't, it won't. And we are hopeful that we can have a discussion today about the way you can help us uh, find a way to see if there's a way to sequester CO2 safely. If not, uh, we're going to go the way the way these glaciers are, and we're going to see more of these headlines. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to join with others who are extending our sympathies and our thoughts to the families. Uh, that have been affected by the mining disaster in West Virginia. And I know that my colleague and others are, are very concerned and are closely working with those affected families. I also want to thank you for the hearing that we have today and thank the witnesses for being here to testify about the future of coal. We've heard some about some of the innovative clean coal technologies, the carbon sequestration that is there, and these are important to those of us who support the use of coal and are concerned about having the ability to continue to use this natural resource as we look at our nation's energy supply. We have to realize that domestically produced coal directly employs over 70,000 Americans and it does contribute hundreds of billions of dollars to our national economy each and every year. With vast coal resources, the U.S. has a secure source of energy not subject to foreign embargoes or cartel-driven pricing. It is enough for the next 
200 years, and Mr. Markey has already highlighted uh, 300 years of use with this product that is right here on American land. As a cheap source of energy, coal power contributes significantly to our high standard of living, quality of life by, by producing abundant, inexpensive heat and power. Certainly those of us in Tennessee are appreciative for the use of coal and realize that we are receiving electricity that is generated by TVA, 40% of their capacity is generated by coal. Since the founding of our republic, coal has played a critical importance in our economic and our technological processes. And we are looking forward to how that is going to continue and move forward. We welcome you, and I yield back. Great. We thank the gentlelady. The gentleman from the state of Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, first of all welcome uh, Gregory Boyce and Stephen Lear, both of whom are from uh, the uh, state of Missouri. We welcome uh, you to the committee hearing. And then I would uh, also associate myself with the comments of uh, the uh, gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, uh, in expressing uh, a sympathy with uh, and concern about the people uh, uh, in West Virginia, uh, Ms. Capito's uh, district. Um, and while I know that there is a great deal of push on what is uh, referred to now as climate gate, uh, that, uh, that, that there were those who were hiding data. Uh, and then when you add to it the, uh, the unusual winter we had, uh, even here in Washington, there were, are those, uh, the uh, climate chang change skeptics who say, you know, this is uh, a big hoax. And although it's counterintuitive, the truth of the matter is that um, we have more snowstorms uh, when it is uh, warmer. And uh, we also, uh, I think, should be uh, aware uh, of the fact that uh, the Center for American Progress says that in spite of what happened here in Washington and, and in uh, areas here on the East Coast, uh, January was the coldest uh, January we've had since records have been kept globally. And so I think we do have an issue that we, we need to, to, to deal with. And uh, China has 80% of its uh, energy supply coming from coal, 40% uh, of, of the U.S. energy comes from coal. Uh, it's going to be around uh, for a while. There's no question about it. Uh, but just as we look at the tragedy in West Virginia, I think there are some exciting things happening in, in West Virginia as well that uh, I hope uh, others can look at, particularly even in my own state, uh, the American Electric Powers uh, Mountaineer Coal Plant uh, in West Virginia is doing some remarkable research in terms of being able to, to uh, direct the CO2 uh, underground. Uh, and uh, they hope to have a commercial scale demonstration by 2015. And it, it would be interesting and productive and positive, I think, for us to discuss the possibility uh, of whether that is exclusively a West Virginia uh, deal that can't be reproduced elsewhere, or whether, it, in fact, it's something that we can export from West Virginia across the country. We have some unique problems in the Midwest. Uh, we are heavily uh, a coal using area of the country. Uh, and I think that uh, if we all work together uh, facing the reality that it is that the planet is getting uh, warmer, that, that we do have uh, an increase in the, in the uh, uh, greenhouse gas gases in our atmosphere, and we all can work together to do something about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, yield back to balance my time. The, we thank the gentleman very much. Um, the chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from uh, West Virginia, Ms. Capito. Uh, and again, we extend the sympathies of the co entire committee to your thank state you. and your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses. And as a um, native-born West Virginian, uh, I want to thank everybody uh, here and, and really throughout the nation who have extended their deep sympathies to us. 
uh, for this latest tragedy. It is, uh, it is gut-wrenching. It, it is really difficult. And in a small state, um, we have a great sense of uh, community, and so we, we all feel it. And I appreciate uh, everybody extending their prayers and good wishes to the families. Um, I think it's um, the last week's mine disaster at Mont Cole at the Upper Big Branch mine killed 29 miners. It was the, fir the worst mine disaster in 40 years. But just four years ago, 12 miners were killed at the Sago mine in my own district. With this best investigation going on and further details that are coming forward, we must continue our commitment to keep miners safe and safety first. Um, we cannot permit this, and we have to prevent this from happening again. Uh, the Upper Big Branch Mine disaster only furthers people's questions of coal mining and has led many to discuss the future of coal. As we've heard today, coal is the primary source of energy throughout the world. Our fast-growing countries, and I'd be interested to hear the uh, gentleman's testimony on how much they're exporting to China and India to rely on coal as the, to fuel, the, fuel their energy demands. But here in the United States, coal is our most abundant domestic resource with recoverable resources sufficient to last 250 years. Coal currently fuels 50 percent of our electricity in this country. In my state of West Virginia, coal powers 98 percent of our electricity. Nationwide, it provides 125,000 direct, well-paid jobs for the U.S. coal miners and supports hundreds of thousands of additional jobs throughout the supply chain. While considering the future of coal in the global warming debate, the things we need to consider and we need to remember is that climate change and energy policies are inextricably linked with economic, environmental, and social issues. Last year, the House passed the American Clean Energy and Security Act, which I did not support this legislation because I believe it stood to push energy prices upward and threaten an economy that's already in trouble. I also was displeased with the way I felt it set up winners and losers across this country. A tax increase on carbon dioxide and emissions will directly come out of consumers' uh, pockets in the term of higher electricity rate, manufacturing output would also fall considerably. Manufacturing firms who have traditionally lied, relied on low and stable electric rates in our states would be subject to massive cost increases, likely forcing them out of business or at least to relocate their operations overseas. We're seeing that now in, in any case. Instead, we need to do much more to accelerate the development of advanced clean coal technologies and, most importantly, CCS. Carbon capture is important to West Virginians in ensuring our nation's uh, energy independence. Without it, we deprive ourselves of the most effective tool for addressing CO2 emissions from coal. We need to provide sufficient funding and incentives to accelerate the development, demonstration, and broad commercial de deployment of CCC CCS technologies. As my colleague from Missouri mentioned, the AEP plant in New Haven, West Virginia, represents a milestone in our efforts to bring CCS online. That's actually in my district. The facility began operations last fall, captures and stores approximately 100,000 metric tons of CO, of CO2 per year. It's the first demonstration at an existing coal-fired plant. The implementation of this technology will not only benefit a state like mine with jobs and technology and revenue, it will also benefit our nation by making clean coal a reality. In addition to climate change, coal has been the subject of continued federal scrutiny for its impact on water quality. Recent action by the President's administration and the EPA to further scrutinize mining permits only confirms an anti-coal agenda. The minority staff on the Senate Committee on Environmental and Public Works initiated an investigation into EPA's handling of Clean Water Act Section 404 permits for coal mining in Appalachia and found that in 2009, EPA froze 235 coal mining 404 permits, claiming that additional time was needed to assess the environmental impacts of mining operations. Since the initiation of this investigation, EPA issued 45 of 235 permits, and to date there are 190 permits that ET EPA continues to hold for operations, including surface, underground, and refuge operations. Furthermore, decisions being made by federal environmental regulators are not focused enough on the importance of coal to the economy. In my conversations with Lisa Jackson, the head of the uh, the EPA, she said that she explicitly omits economic considerations from her decision-making process. I find this particularly troubling. The EPA's delays in handling these permits is already jeopardizing jobs in Appalachia and is weakening our energy security. 
Even more disturbing, on March 26, the EPA announced their intent to veto the existing spruce uh, mine permit. The decision by the EPA to veto the spruce permit brings into question the reliability of the entire permitting process and shows their complete disregard for the impacts it will have on uh, our nation's economy and on my state in particular. And I think it reeks of a lack of sense of fairness. I look forward to hearing the testimonies from the panel. Thank you. The great gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate you having this hearing today. But I'm pleased today to uh, have three of Colorado's largest employers uh, sitting in front of us here today. Arch Cole, Peabody, and Rio Tinto all provide much needed jobs in the third congressional district. Thank you very much for what you do for Colorado. Uh, the state of Colorado is home to 407 mining operations and provides employment for nearly 45,000 Coloradans. Mining jobs in Colorado are high paying jobs, 43 percent higher than the average wage in the state. The average annual wage in the mining industry in Colorado was 65000 in 2007. Total direct earnings from the state of Colorado's mining payroll were $810 million. Clearly, this is a sizable contribution to our state, particularly uh, now at a time when jobs and income are at a premium. I think we all know that coal is not the only and final answer to energy independence, but we should realize that it must and it will play a valuable role in providing energy to our country as it is one of America's most abundant natural resources. We must continue to invest financial resources in research and development for all potential clean energy sectors such as biofuels, solar, wind, algae, and carbon capture and sequestration. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing once again and I think it's vitally important that coal remain a uh, source of energy, um, but we must uh, do everything that we can to minimize the carbon footprints that many mines and plants may leave behind. And um, I refer to one of your comments in your opening uh, statement where you mentioned that there was over $60 billion uh, provided for the coal industry for uh, clean coal burning technology, I believe. It is my understanding that uh, the bill only secured $4.5 billion, but maybe I'm mistaken. Thank you. No, it, it, I thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The, the, inside of the waxwell Mackey bill, there is $60 billion. $60 billion. Carbon capture, yeah. Uh, at least $60 billion, to be honest. Um, the chair recognizes the um, gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'll request unanimous consent to insert my opening statement uh, into the record and not uh, read it here in full in the interest of time for our hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I do want to thank uh, all the witnesses for being here and for their testimony today to help us answer what I think is a critically important question. I particularly want to recognize uh, Peabody Energy, which operates in Arizona and produces coal there and provides uh, thousands of jobs in Arizona, as well as Rio Tinto, which does not mine coal in Arizona but does mine copper in Arizona, also contributing to our economy. With respect to coal, coal is, as I think we all know, an important uh, natural resource uh, whose production uh, creates many jobs uh, for American workers. The United States has the largest national coal reserves in the world, representing 28 percent, I believe, of the global reserves. Uh, it is America's most abundant, abundant energy resource. Uh, we have approximately 270 billion tons of coal reserves, enough to last well over 250 years. How we handle this resource is vitally important. If we mishandle it and impose restrictions on it, which drive its cost through the roof or make it unaffordable, then we will all, as a nation, pay a price. Uh, any tax that we impose on carbon uh, will be passed on to the consumers of uh, the energy that carbon-producing uh, fuel uh, produces and will be absorbed by those consumers uh, and will do damage to uh, the economic viability of the companies who rely upon it. Uh, obviously, we have a duty to be careful in our conduct and to carefully examine the issue. The questions about uh, global warming need to be examined carefully and thought through th thoroughly. David Sokol of Mid-American Energy Holdings testified before the Energy Committee earlier this year that he could meet every single carbon capture and sequestration goal uh, in the Waxman-Markey legislation, but that by doing it by that legislation, we were doubling the cost. It seems to me we cannot do that to our nation at this particularly difficult and challenging economic time. We need those jobs and we need that energy. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. They don't we, work. We, we, uh, no, they don't. <laughs> they just don't work. The budget committee 
who's can't afford the hearing room where yeah has That's not it. properly funded their um, their communication system. We thank the gentleman. Um, so that completes uh, opening statements from the uh, members. And uh, I'll just take a brief moment here. Uh, today is the last hearing for our chief clerk, Ali Brodsky. Uh, she has overseen every single hearing uh, of the select committee uh, since its inception, uh, from the top of Cannon Mountain in New Hampshire to today in the Cannon Building. Uh, Ali has been our constant. We wish her all the best as she leaves to join Teach for America uh, in Chicago. And as proof of her dedication to the select committee, she is flying there tonight uh, and still came here today to uh, oversee and run this uh, last hearing. So, Allie, the committee owes you our thanks for your exemplary public service. Thank you so, so much for everything that you've done. Uh, So now we'll turn to our, um, our witnesses, and we thank them uh, for being here. Our first witness is Mr. Gregory Boyce. Uh, Mr. Boyce is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Peabody Energy. Peabody is the world's biggest private sector coal company with customers in 23 countries and six continents. Uh, Mr. Boyce joined Peabody in 2003 as President and Chief Operating Officer and has extensive United States and international management operating and engineering experience. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. Mr. Boyce, whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Well, good morning, Chairman Markey and distinguished members of the committee. And on behalf of all of uh, Peabody employees, we also extend our thoughts and prayers to the fallen miners in West Virginia. Um, You've asked me to discuss the role of coal in a new energy age, and it's my privilege to speak to a topic of vital importance to the American people, the U.S. economy, and the world. I am Chairman and CEO of Peabody Energy, the world's largest private sector coal company, a global leader in clean coal solutions, and Mr. Chairman, I also agree that we can provide a safer and cleaner path for coal in the future. My testimony will focus on what I believe are the three top issues we face as a society energy, the economy, and the environment. We call them the three E's. Coal plays an enormous role in solving each. I'll take these one at a time. Energy security, coal is a future fuel to provide clean, made in America energy, and we have the world's largest supply right under our feet. Economic stimulus, greater deployment of clean coal technology will reindustrialize the U.S. economy through clean, green jobs and infrastructure. And environmental solutions, coal with carbon capture and storage, or green coal, is a low-cost, low-carbon energy solution. Now, as we contemplate decisions that will affect every American and every global citizen, let me start with the macro view. Mr. Chairman, everyone here today is a member of the so-called, quote, golden billion. We enjoy a standard of living most only can dream about, thanks in large part to affordable energy. The global population will grow 25 percent to more than 8 billion people by 2030, and the world will need the equivalent power of five more Americas to fuel these needs. This growth occurs at a time when more than half the world's population still lacks adequate access to electricity. So we have the dual challenge of providing electricity to 3.6 billion people who aren't properly connected and expanding our infrastructure to another 2 billion people who will be added to the grid. Uh, we would uh, please uh, oh, ask oh, for, dirty. we would please. We would please ask for the uh, security uh, officials to restore order in the uh, committee hearing room.
Uh, we apologize uh, to you uh, uh, for the uh, interruption, and uh, we will uh, recognize you again, uh, Mr. Boyce, <coughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, without any uh, time obviously being deducted from the uh, oral presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I was saying, we, we have an issue of the two billion people who will be added to our energy grid in the future. And how do we satisfy this growth? With coal. It's the primary global generation fuel and is expected to grow faster than any other fuels combined in coming decades. So while some others call coal a bridge to the future, I say coal is the future. It powers nearly half of America's electricity at a fraction of the cost of other fuels, and Americans enjoy the best quality of life in the world. Let's move to the economy. We all recognize that jobs are the number one priority for the American people. Greater deployment of advanced technologies, including CCS, over the next several decades would create tremendous economic stimulus, reindustrializing our economic base and putting people to work. A 2009 study by the National Coal Council concluded that deployment of coal with CCS would increase U.S. GDP by $2.7 trillion, create 20 million job years from new construction, and support 800,000 permanent jobs over 40 years. Enhanced oil recovery from CS would produce an additional 2 million barrels of oil per day. So our three E goals are complementary and advanced through clean coal technologies, which have a strong record of success. U.S. coal used for electricity generation has more than tripled since 1970, yet criteria emissions have been reduced by 84 percent. Technology can lead us to a lower CO2 world. And here's the path. First, build supercritical combustion plants with improved efficiencies. Second, demonstrate carbon capture and storage. We know the technology works. Statoil's sleepner project in the North Sea has been storing a million tons of CO2 annually for 15 years. Third, complete large-scale CCS demonstrations. Fourth, advance coal to gas with CCS, so the ultimate cost of capturing and storing CO2 is reduced. Next, deploy commercial-scale IGC technology with CCS. And finally, retrofit the world's existing fleet of coal plants with CCS technologies. A growing number of studies conclude that coal with CCS is the low-cost, low-carbon solution, 15 to 50 percent less expensive than others. And around the world, nations have committed significant funding for CCS demonstrations. But the funding is needed to bring this, more funding is needed to bring this technology to commercial scale. Now, that's a brief view of the essential role of coal and the need for continuous improvement in emissions toward our shared goal of near zero emissions. But I'd like to close with a look at carbon legislation. There's a growing recognition in Washington for the vital role that coal plays in providing energy security and affordable electricity for Americans, and we saw this in elements of the Waxman-Markey bill. Achieving our three E goals will require smart, science-based policies to protect the American consumer, worker, and family. I say deployable technology should be available before regulation, and we have to take the time to get this right and we have to have the national commitment to get it right. Now let me emphasize that Peabody will support the right kind of legislation which builds on the positives of the Waxman-Markey House bill. It's essential for us to provide a legal and regulatory structure to enable robust development of CCS that assumes federal responsibility for long-term CO2 storage, offers timelines for emissions reductions that allow for technology development, eliminates conflicting frameworks at the state and federal level. We believe that a strong energy bill that advances CCS is the best way to achieve both our energy and environmental goals. Those goals are not accomplished by cap and trade programs that will result in punishing costs to economies and family budgets. For those who say that a cap and trade system can be cost effective, I don't agree. The only reasonable possibility on this front would be a ceiling of, say, $12 a ton that Senators Bingham and Inspector advanced several years ago. But here again, the only path to meet CO2 goals is through technology. I say this after just returning from China, where the presidents of both our nations have committed to a clean energy path that includes low carbon coal. Peabody is the only non-Chinese equity partner in GreenGen, a near zero emissions power plant that will begin generating power next year. If China can build these types of plants, why can't we not here in the U.S.? The U.S. could also be a provider of the technology for the rest of the world. So in conclusion, the real question isn't, will we use coal? The U.S. has more coal than any nation on Earth. We have hundreds of billions of tons of coal in the U.S., trillions of tons in the world. We will use it all. The real question is, what is the proper path to move to what the presidents of both China and the U.S. last year called, quote, 21st century coal? 
That path is technology first, deployment requirements second, as we work together to accelerate the movement to green coal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. Our next uh, witness is Mr. Stephen Lear. He has served as the President and Chief Executive Officer of Arch Coal since 1992. Arch Coal is the nation's second largest coal company. We welcome you, Mr. Lear. Thank you, Chairman Markey, committee members. I appreciate the invitation to offer my views on the role of coal and coal technology in meeting the nation's clean energy needs and for reducing CO2 emissions. But first, let me echo our prayers and sympathy for the min miners and their families that were lost last uh, week in West Virginia. This committee has an extremely difficult task addressing extremely complex subjects. With this in mind, I'm going to focus on just four points. My first point is that coal is being used and will continue to be used around the globe. Coal supplies roughly 23 percent of the U.S. energy needs and roughly 27 percent of global energy requirements. Global coal use since 2000 has increased more than any other fuel and that trend is expected to continue. Coal is used, use is growing because it is abundant, widely distributed, and because it is relatively inexpensive. Coal helps billions of people around the world enjoy a higher standard of living than would otherwise be possible. That's the good news. My second point is the bad news. Coal emits more carbon dioxide than other major fuel sources per unit of energy. Which brings me to my third point. We, be, we believe technology is the answer. Clean coal technology has solved earlier environmental problems associated with coal use and continues to improve the burning of coal's emissions. Emissions of particulate matter, SO2, and NOx have gone down as previously referenced in several comments. We can be successful in capturing and isolating CO2 with carbon capture and storage technologies, or CCS. Most elements of CCS have been shown to work and in individual elements, but not necessarily at scale or altogether, and it is not inexpensive at the moment. DOE and others have developed technology roadmaps for solving the technological problems associated with CCS and driving down costs. We know where we need to go with CCS, and we have identified a path to get there, but I'm not saying that we are there yet, because we are not. But I'm convinced that we can get there, first because we have already gotten off to a fairly good start, and second, because we really have no other choice if we're serious about go and going to be successful in stabilizing global CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And that is not just my view. In former Prime Minister Tony Blair's assessment of CCS, he said, quote, the vast majority of new power stations in India and China will be coal-fired. Not may be coal-fired, will be. So developing carbon capture and storage technology is not optional. It is literally of the essence, unquote. Remember, China uses three times as much coal as the U.S., and the Chinese use of coal is growing at about 200 million tons every year. The International Energy Agency found that a scenario which lacked a CCS option was 97 percent more costly than one which included CCS technology. The IEA has concluded that, quote, CO2 capture and storage for power generation and industry is the most important single new technology, unquote. CCS technology is also a, a job creator. A report last December by the National Coal Council, a federal advisory committee to the Secretary of Energy, concluded that CCS deployment through 2050 could produce 28 million job years of construction employment and create 800,000 permanent jobs. The promise of CCS still has many barriers to overcome. American Electric Power is at the forefront of CCS technology and currently is in the process of scaling up a test facility in West Virginia that will store about 1.5 million tons of CO2 per year in deep saline formations. Their pilot demonstration plant is built, but we can't say that we have solved all the problems yet. And in reality, we have over 2 billion tons of power plant CO2 to deal with in the U.S., let alone the rest of the world. My fourth and final point covers the actions that we need to take in order for CCS to be commercially available and affordable in a timely manner. One, we need to sharply expand the number of commercial CCS demonstration pro projects to the 15 to 20 recommended by the NRC. Two, we need to follow up with continuing financial support for the first 60 gigawatts of generating capacity. Three, we need to address the legal framework that poses barriers to CCS technology, like the long-term liability of the stored CO2. 
Therefore, we need to ensure that the policies do no harm or provide disincentives to CCS. For example, some are proposing that we provide a financial incentive to deploy for the deployment of natural gas to displace coal and power plants. I believe this would be a mistake on several fronts. While natural gas emits 50% of the CO2 of coal, it will require CCS to achieve the long-term climate goals. A dash to ca gas will put CCS development on hold and the technology will not be available when it is needed domestically or globally. Of course, the availability of sufficient quantities of natural gas to replace coal, particularly as a at a reasonable price, is another question mark. An alternative approach would be to expand current proposals for federal renewable electricity standards to include fossil fuel generation with CCS, advanced nuclear power generation, and improved efficiencies at existing power plants. In closing, let me reiterate my four points. Coal is and will remain an important part of the U.S. and global energy mix, providing benefits to billions of people. Coal's issue is CO2. The solution is carbon capture and technology, storage technologies. Commercializing CS, CCS in the desired time frame will require industry, government collaboration, significant resources, and an appropriate legal framework. But it can be done. In fact, it must be done if we're going to stabilize global CO2 concentrations by 2050. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lear. Uh, and our next witness today is Mr. Mike Carey. He, Mr. Carey is the president of the Ohio Coal Association. Uh, he has a diverse uh, background that includes military service uh, and legislative relations in both the energy and natural resource industries. Uh, we welcome you, sir. Thank you, Chairman Markey, members of the committee. My name is Mike Carey, president of the Ohio Coal, Associ Associ Coal Association, border state to West Virginia, and our prayers are with the families there as well. I'd like to take a moment to thank my fellow witnesses, both from Arch Coal and Peabody Energy, for their continued commitment to the American coal industry. However, I must point out at this time that Rio Tinto has been divesting themselves of domestic coal reserves for many years, and I do not believe they represent the future of coal in America. Given the high levels of re recoverable coal reserves and increasing demand for energy, especially in developing nations where low-cost electricity is essential, coal's future global success is assured. However, coal mining and use in the United States is severely jeopardized by the war on coal waged through the legislative process and the unprecedented regulatory actions. But in the rest of the world, our competitors are investing in coal to make them more competitive and to steal our jobs. China alone continues to build a new power plant about every week. I'd like to leave you with three main points. First, the Obama administration's regulatory assault on energy production, and the war on coal in particular, is creating a de facto Obama energy tax on all American families. Second, the CCS provisions in the Waxman-Markey bill and other climate proposals encourage massive fuel switching to be more expensive before natural, natural gas before the CCS technology can be deployed. But even then, the lack of regulatory, legal frameworks will prevent commercial deployment of the technology. And despite the recent tragedy in West Virginia, the U.S. coal mining industry has the best safety record in the world. The role of coal in the new energy age is greatly hampered by the regulatory assault waged by the Obama administration, and in particular, the Environmental Protection Agency. While President Obama may not directly raise taxes, his administration is implementing the Obama energy tax on all American families by administrative fiat. We are in the process of calculating how much this will cost the American families in higher energy bills. The chart that you see behind me lists a number of the proposals, final, planned regulatory salts on the coal industry, and I will briefly highlight a couple of them. The Ohio Coal Association is challenging the, is challenging the endangerment finding in court. We believe that the science that is underpinning the endangerment finding is questionable and that the EPA did not include required parts of the economic analysis. According to the EPA, they relied substantially on the IPCC and the data which is at the heart of the ClimateGate scandal. Only 52 scientists signed the UNIPC fourth assessment report and it is cited in the endangerment finding astounding 49 times and 395 in the technical supporting documents. Next. We've seen the Clean Water Act used inappropriately in many ways to hamper the production and use of coal. 
such as the use of the Clean Water Guidelines on surface mining permits issued just last month, which would basically put a moratorium on mining in Appalachia. The Clean Water Act veto of an existing Army, Army Corps of permit through the Corps of Engineers is unprecedented. The Waxman-Markey CCS provisions are an attempt to persuade the coal industry to support the cap and tax. The bill, according to my numbers, allocates $10 billion towards CCS, but misses the mark in two regards. First is timing. The legislation requires emission reduction starting, next, in, starting in 2012. The restrictive performance standards on coal-fired power plants in 2020, ignoring what the developers of the CCS technology have been saying for years, which will take 15 to 20 years before commercial de development. The United States Congress simply cannot dictate a timeline of technological developments. Secondly, the bill calls merely for a study to report back to Congress with recommendations on issues such as CCS liability, permitting, and other environmental considerations. CRS and GAO have already provided information on liability and permitting problems and the need to address for CCS to work. The way the CCS program in the Markey Waxman or the Waxman-Markey bill is structured actually encourage massive fuel switching to more expensive natural gas before the CCS technology can actually be deployed. But even then, the lack of regulatory legal liability frameworks will prevent commercial deployment of the technology. In conclusion, domestic coal production needs the support of Congress and this administration. Despite the recent events in West Virginia, the U.S. coal mining industry has the best safety record in the world. Mine Safety Health Administration data showed that there were 18 coal mining fatalities last year amongst 133,000 coal miners, an improvement of up to 63% over numbers three years before. By contrast, the BBC estimates that 13 Chinese coal miners die every day in their, in their coal mine. Our safety record is largely due to our combined national and state efforts to encourage innovative and safety practices. The Ohio Coal Association recently collaborated with the Ohio Legislative Process Legislature and worked to pass a new safe mine safety bill in our state, even though we had not had a mine fatality in five years. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering any of the questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Carey. And our final witness is Mr. Preston Hiaro. He is the group executive for technology and innovation for Rio Tinto. Rio Tinto is the largest diversified mining company in the United States and the third largest mining and exploration company in the world. Rio Tinto also holds a 48 percent interest in Cloud Peak Energy, which is the third largest coal company in the United States. Uh, we welcome you, Mr. Chiaro. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Chairman Markey, distinguished members, first, thank you for inviting me to testify today on the role of coal in a new energy age. And like my fellow miners, on behalf of the employees of Rio Tinto, I wish to extend, extend our thoughts and sympathies to the families of the miners who lost their lives in West Virginia last week. As you said, my name is Preston Chiaro. I am the group executive for technology and innovation for Rio Tinto. Rio is the largest diversified mining company in the U.S. and one of the largest diversified mining companies in the world. Our U.S. assets include coal holdings in, in Colorado, copper in Utah, nickel and copper projects in Michigan and Arizona, borates in California, talc in Montana and Vermont, as well as an aluminum smelter in Kentucky. We have nearly 5,000 U.S. employees, all told. As you also mentioned, we hold a 48 percent interest in Cloud Peak Energy, formerly known as Rio Tinto Energy America, the third largest coal company here in the U.S. We're also one of the largest coal producers and exporters in Australia and we also happen to be a major uranium producer. Rio Tinto established its climate change position in 1998. We recognize that man-made emissions of greenhouse gases are contributing to global climate change and that action is necessary to reduce those emissions and to adapt to a changing climate. As a coal producer, a large energy consumer, and a technology developer, Rio Tinto continues to devote resources and funds to the development of low emission coal technology in particular carbon capture and storage, or CCS, technology. This technology affords coal and eventually natural gas a tremendous opportunity to position itself as a low carbon energy source both in the U.S. and globally. In 2007, we launched the Hydrogen Energy Joint Venture with BP Alternative Energy. Through the Hydrogen Energy California project in Kern County, California, we are developing the first full-scale fossil-fueled electricity plant 
to capture and store up to 90% of its emissions upon deployment. Once fully operational in 2015, the plant will provide low carbon electricity to over 150,000 Southern California homes, while permanently storing 2 million tons of CO2 per year in a nearby oil field, creating 1,500 construction jobs and 100 permanent operational positions. Rio Tinto believes that it is critical for the world to transition away from high emitting conventional fossil fuel electricity generation by the middle of this century. We continue to support and advocate the recommendations included in the blueprint for legislative action developed last year by the U.S. Climate Action Partnership, which we're a member. And we've gone on record in support of their inclusion in H.R. 2454 to address the existing technical, financial, legal, and regulatory bottlenecks to the commercialization of carbon capture and storage technology. Economic modeling of U.S. Climate Action Partnership's recommendations indicates that the long-run transition costs are small when climate policies are market-based and economy-wide, when forest and land-based offsets are available to contain costs, and when we allocate funding to the development of technologies such as carbon capture and storage that keep coal in the energy mix. In fact, U.S. CAP studied a wide range of economic models, and they all show that U.S. economic output levels of, of consumption and jobs, things we all care deeply about, are virtually identical to business as usual, even years after a climate policy such as H.R. 2454 is put in place. For example, compared to business as usual, the sum total impact to the general economy, household consumption, and number of jobs can be viewed as a growth delay of eight to nine months over 20 years, and most scenarios show a delay of only a couple of months. Well-constructed policy provides the best means to address the multiple challenges facing our industry. We will either participate in the shaping of policy or we will have the policy thrust upon us. Our experience has been that constructive participation in the policy process can yield positive outcomes on the issues most important to us. I thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chiaro, very much. Uh, the chair will now recognize himself for a round of questions. Um, and this is for you, Mr. Chiaro, Ms. Valier, and Mr. Boyce. Um, do you agree with a statement made by uh, Mr. Don Blankenship of uh, Massey Energy that, quote, global warming is a hoax and a Ponzi scheme, as he indicated on his Twitter page on February 19th of 2010? Mr. Chiaro. As I mentioned, Rio Tinto recognized in 1998 that climate change was a serious issue, that human emissions were a primary cause of it, and we think action needs to be taken soon to address it. Mr. Lear. I don't agree with Mr. Blankenship. Um, we look at climate change as an evolving issue that's serious and needs to be addressed. Uh, we think how we address it and that technology is the most critical piece of that uh, path forward. Mr. Boyce. Do not agree with Mr. Blankenship. Uh, our view is uh, the globe's climate has been changing since the globe was formed. Uh, levels of CO2 have risen in the atmosphere, and we have been a strong advocate for uh, technology advances to reduce uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, particularly from the use of coal. So um, the next question comes to you, Mr. Carey. I'm a little bit confused because uh, we were we're being uh, told by the natural gas industry that we did too much for coal in the waxman markey bill and not enough for natural gas. And that is what natural gas executives are saying to us. Do natural gas executives not understand how much more we helped them than you, uh, since they are of the opinion that this $60 billion, which we put in for carbon capture and sequestration, and the other tools that we put in place in order to minimize the impact on coal consumers across our country uh, are clearly being viewed by the natural gas industry as being much more friendly to the coal industry than to the natural gas industry. What don't they understand? You seem to think that there's a bias towards, natu towards natural gas. Um, Mr. Chairman, I was, I was referring to the timetables, but unfortunately I don't work for the natural gas industry. But I can tell you this, according to the studies that uh, uh, that, that I read, 
with, uh, with regards to what coal production would look, would look like by 2030 under the, under the uh, proposals that have been initiated, we would look at a 77 percent decrease in the amount of coal. Now, for the 3,000 and some coal miners in, in Ohio, uh, the folks in West Virginia, Kentucky, Western Pennsylvania, uh, when you're eliminating 77 percent of those jobs, that's a concern. And when you look at the Appalachian communities and you look at what an average coal miner makes, uh, in Ohio it's roughly 65000 I believe uh, Congressman Salazar talked about Colorado being 65000 no, I understand that. I'm, Mr. I'm Chairman, going, it's, I'm it would be the devastating. To, to, to the question on natural gas, sir, you're just dead wrong, okay? Uh, we, we absolutely ensured that we would deal with the coal industry in a transition uh, and in such a way that actually it drew criticism from the natural gas industry. So you're just wrong. Okay, and I just want to put that out there, plain and simple. Uh, we did not uh, approach this issue as anything other than one in which we wanted to create a bridge for the coal industry uh, to the future. Okay, and uh, any other uh, interpretation is just plain wrong, and the natural gas industry will testify to that. And uh, over in the Senate, in fact, they're now lobbying uh, in order to receive equivalent uh, benefits to what the coal industry uh, received. Uh, Mr. Boyce, and I think this is important for us to clarify this uh, issue. Uh, in your petition to the Environmental Protection Agency to overturn the scientific finding that greenhouse gases endanger public health and welfare, you state Peabody's petition is based primarily on the release of email and other information from the University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit in November of last year. The British House of Commons uh, has now reported uh, that the hacked emails from the University of East Anglia Climate Research Unit do not in any way cast doubt on the overwhelming scientific evidence of anthropogenic climate change. Do you now accept the broad understanding by scientists and governments that greenhouse gases threaten to destabilize the global climate? Um, what we, our, our view and what we said in the petition was we think that EPA should take a step back um, and do more work internal to the U.S. Uh, to rely so heavily on an international body which did not have the ability for uh, people here in the U.S. and scientists here in the U.S. to have the level of peer review. Um, and with the number of issues that have come out relative to some of their basic data assumptions as well as interpretations, all we've asked is that the EPA step back and reconsider their endangerment finding. So you continue to question then the scientific finding that greenhouse gases endanger public health and welfare? As we look at the IPCC report and all of the issues that came out relative to its data and its interpretations, we think there needs to be another independent review of that data. Whether those findings are sound or not, we think there need to be another review to put to rest all of those issues. Uh, Mr. Lear, do you, uh, do you question the scientific findings that greenhouse ga uh, gases endanger public health and welfare? I think that uh, the EPA is a very, and using the Clean Air Act and, and their approach, it's the Clean Air Act is a very blunt instrument to try to address a very complex problem. I'm just going to the question right. of and, the and you, you earlier seemed to indicate, you and Mr. Boyce, along with Mr. Chiaro, all seem to indicate that you acknowledge that climate change is occurring and that it is caused uh, by uh, CO2 or other greenhouse gases. And now it seems as though you're backing away from it. So I'm just trying to determine which is it. Is it yeah, I'm, I'm only going to the scientific question here right. of whether or not greenhouse gases do in fact cause global warming. I think they are contributing to global warming and that, you know, again, I was trained as an engineer. I look at it, how do we address the problem? And I'll let others, because uh, I'm certainly not a climate scientists and only know what I've read as well as, as others uh, comments that whether the East Anglia um, emails are an issue or not, uh, they certainly I think raise questions in people's minds, but more importantly if we're going to address this problem, which I think we should, it's going to be driven by technologies of carbon capture. Otherwise, I don't think we can achieve the, the 
2050 goals that are outlined in your bill are outlined in many other bills. And, and, that, and that's my, I'm again, the engineer approach. Mr. Lee, we do agree with you on that, and that's why we put those tens of billions of dollars in the bill, so that there would be a technological solution that uh, we could uh, partner on creating. Uh, Mr. Carroll, do you uh, agree that, um, that uh, the scientific, uh, with the scientific finding that greenhouse gases endanger public health and welfare? Uh, we do think the science is strong, yes. Okay, well, we, we thank you for that. We, again, we, we need to have, if we're going to create a public policy, we at least have to agree on this basic fundamental fact uh, that the planet is warming and that greenhouse gases uh, are contributing uh, to that problem. And, uh, and we still seem to have some disagreement here. And uh, you, Mr. Boyce, uh, are, are not, uh, in fact, dealing with the issue scientifically in a way that divides the question from the, from the means by which we would then deal with the issue. Okay, so we just need a clear, we just need a clear statement here on that subject uh, from you. And I just, let me come back to you just one, this one final time on the science of global warming and on the relationship between greenhouse gases uh, and the warming of the planet. Well, as I said, Mr. Chairman, um, the, the one known fact that we deal with is that CO2 has risen uh, in the atmosphere over the last 100 years. Um, and what we have always said is we want to use coal cleaner every day that we use it. We have uh, almost a half, uh, almost a dozen clean energy projects that we're involved with in Australia, in China, in the U.S. Um, you know, I think the you know, the scientific discussion, we leave to the scientists. Uh, what we say is we understand the public policy and the desire to have cleaner coal. We agree with that. And we are putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into trying to make that happen on a global basis. Again, whether it's in Australia, uh, tens of millions of dollars, whether it's our partnership in China, uh, in Green Gen or Future Gen uh, here in the U.S., We've made investments in Calera, uh, which is a uh, new startup company to produce cement from CO2 capture. We have money invested in Great Point Energy, which is trying to develop uh, cleaner ways of gasifying coal. So um, at the end of the day, it's our actions to try and promote and be a catalyst for clean coal technologies. And, and we agree with you, mm -hmm. Mr. Boyce. That is that your investments in Calera, your investments in other companies shows that you are working to solve the problem. But what we need you to say, because that will end this, this first stage of debate, is that there is a problem uh, and that the science has identified a problem that has to be solved and that your investments uh, are related to that conclusion that there is a problem and that you accept it because then we can move on to working together to put together the solutions to solve the problem. So can we come back again to that scientific yeah. question? Mr. Chairman, I think I've said we agree CO2 is rising in the atmosphere. That's an issue that needs to be addressed, and we're doing everything we can to try and promote technologies to address that issue. Thank you, Mr. Boyce. Thank all of you. Let me now turn and recognize the general lady from West Virginia, Ms. Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There, got it. Uh, thank you. I wanted to uh, ask a question to uh, Mr. Boyce and Mr. Lear that I alluded to in my opening statement, and I'm curious to know which uh, in both of your companies, how what percent of your coal do you, do you currently export into what generally, what are your largest exporting uh, countries, Mr. Boyce? This is domestic coal that's mined here. Yeah, r today we, uh, we are exporting very, very small quantities of mm -hmm. coal in the export business. Uh, as you know, we no longer have an oper any operations in the eastern part of the U.S. where most of the U.S. exports come from. Mm -hmm. We have a small amount of coal from Colorado and a very small amount of coal from the Midwest, which we export to Europe. Uh, other than that, the vast, all of our exports are from Australia to the Far East. So you're exporting your Australian product into China? Uh, uh, we export Australia all over the world, China, mm -hmm. uh, India, Japan, Europe, Brazil. Uh, Mr. Lear? Um, last year, even in the economic downturn, uh, downturn we did export um, 
you know, a few boats out of uh, Wyoming into the Pacific Rim. They ended up being in China and I think India. It, it was a trader at the, the second boat. Um, on the East Coast, out of specifically mostly West Virginia, but also Kentucky and, and Virginia, uh, we're exporting somewhere between three and four million tons a year in a normal year. Last year was down due to the economic recession. Uh, this year, uh, just given the, the nature of particularly the metallurgical markets, uh, we're seeing a, a significant rise in export opportunities. And I would guess that bef when the year is done, we'll end up somewhere between the four to six million tons of exports. Okay, thank you. The reason I'm uh, bringing that out and, and, and curious about whether it's on the rise is because if we're going to put a fourth policies here, in our in our own country to meet certain emission goals, uh, would the would the industry then begin to look at other areas of the world who maybe aren't buying into emission goals to then you know push the product out uh, across the rest of the world? And I have a I have a hunch. I mean, you are in, are in business to make money. That's probably what could happen. But I'm going to shift to another topic: technology. All of all of you've talked about the need for technology. Um, but there's an undercurrent here of is it technology before emission targets or emission targets before technology? When do you reasonably think uh, something uh, that can be used full scale and go broad, broad based in this country in terms of CCS can actually be implemented in this country with success and achieving uh, substantial targets? I know that's a ballpark, but. <laughs> it is a ballpark. Um, and, and no one can uh, really project the, the technology, technology curve other than history would tell you that uh, once we get started it comes sooner and often we get uh, significant advances. Uh, in talking with our utility customers who really are, are at the forefront of this, I, I think most of them talk somewhere in the mid-20s if we get started now. Uh, the key really is having the legal framework established and the funding and uh, certainly uh, you know the Waxman, Marky Waxman bill um, uh, was a great start on that one issue. Uh, we had other concerns but uh, we, you know, again I'm an engineer, I look at how do you solve the problem. You solve the problem by technology, otherwise we can't stabilize CO2. Well but I mean there's a, there's a body of thought out there that believes this technology never will be able to achieve. I mean, I, I hear it certainly in what in in uh, around uh, a lot of skeptics that we, we we're never going to be able to meet these targets. Do you have a response to that? Uh, I do. Uh, and, and when you look at global CO2 emissions, we better hope that we can establish this technology because that's what you want. Mm -hmm. There, no one has offered a path that allows energy growth and meets energy growth demands that on a global scale other than the technology to, car to capture carbon and store it. And it's a, it's a pretty simple answer. People may disagree with it the, that they don't like it, but that is the path to stabilize CO2 in the atmosphere, and no one else has offered a path to do it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Insel. Uh Thank you. Mr. Kerry, uh, I found your comments that somehow Congress is waging a war on your industry pretty astounding. Um, and the reason I say that is I was thinking about your comments. I, I ran into my grandchild, he's 15 months old yesterday, on the sidewalk, got to mess around with him for a while. And I started thinking about what your industry is doing to his future. Uh, because of the emissions from your industry, it is probable that there will be no healthy coral reefs in the world uh, during my grandson's lifetime. It is probable that there will be no glaciers in Glacier National Park, which was a national treasure in his lifetime. It is probable that the acidification of the ocean will continue to an extent that in some ways that we can't entirely predict will affect the food chain upon which the salmon depend which my granddad and my dad and I and my wife fish for that he won't be able to fish for. It is probable that there will be significant changes in the, in the climate in the Southwest so maybe he won't go to and get to enjoy the Southwest like I have in his lifetime. If there is a war being waged here, it's a war on our grandkids. 
because the emissions from your industry are destroying significant parts of this one and only little planet we've got. Now that's just a scientific fact. Now I don't think of it as a war because the people in your industry are great people. They're hard working folks, they're trying to make a living, they want to have a future in this industry and I recognize that. So I don't use that term of war because I don't think they're waging war on our grandchildren. But I think your position is so irresponsible for your own industry that I've got to call it out. We have put in a pool of $60 billion to your industry to be able to save it. Save it in the sense that you'll have a way to sequester carbon dioxide. And the, the smart folks on this panel recognize that the day will come that coal will not be a viable alternative if we do not find that technology. And we've given you $60 billion. We don't give $60 billion to Al Qaeda. You want to see a war? We're in a war. We don't give them $60 billion. We don't give $60 billion to industries we're in war with. We give $60 billion to people we hope maybe there's a chance of saving. And that's what we're doing. So let me just ask you, will you personally or your organization that you represent tell us that you will replace that $60 billion uh, that we have offered you in this, in this bill? Chairman Markey, Re Congressman Inslee, um, let me, the, it was a long question, there were many parts of it. Listen, I, I don't want you to answer my, my comments, I want you to answer my question. Will you personally, and I think the answer is probably no, or your company or your organization tell the American public and the people you represent today that you will put up $60 billion to help save this industry by finding CCS technology to replace the money you're trying to take away by killing this legislation. Will you do that? That's a pretty simple yes or no. Well, I, I think, the, uh, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Inslee, I, th I think we have, to, we have to examine parts of the question. The, if we're talking about CCS technology, now look, I said, on, I said I'm the chairman of the Ohio Coal Technical Advisory Committee. This is a body that actually works with clean coal projects and we have been looking at for the last 10 years uh, carbon sequestration and discussions on carbon sequestration. I appreciate that. Nobody, I, 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 I really, nobody I really is arguing want you to answer that that is question. important. I would really appreciate an answer. Are you personally or your organization willing to commit today to spending $60 billion to try to perfect CCS technology? to replace the money you'll lose if this legislation doesn't pass. Just give me a yes or no. I've got one more question I've got to ask Mr. Boyce. Well, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Isley, Inslee, I would say that CCS is important. But if you're asking well, I, me to pay, make a personal commitment that I will personally uh, put $60 billion into no, carbon no, no. sequestration, that's not a very serious question, How about your, how about your question, company? Congressman. Will your company My association? To? Yes. My your association, association represents small, medium-range okay, companies I'm take your answer that no. actually work on behalf of Ohio. Got it. Thank you. I've got to ask Mr. Boyce a question. I'll take your answer as no. If you want to amend it, go ahead. Mr. Boyce, as I understand your position, uh, listening to your testimony, you seem to recognize the necessity, if, if not urgency, of de developing CCS technology. Mm -hmm. But I seem to, if I can characterize your corporate philosophy, you have resisted in any way, every way that I can ascertain any uh, legal mechanism that would put a restriction on carbon dioxide emissions, which would many of us would believe would drive investments into CCS technology. And what I hear you saying is that if we just trust the industry to make these investments, everything will be okay. Folks at this table will put in billions of dollars. I don't know where you're going to get it, because you won't get it from us if we don't pass this bill, but you will put in billions of dollars you will solve this problem, and then after you solve this problem, then we can put a regulation on the industry of CO2. Now, to me, that's a little bit like saying when they stop robbing banks, then we can put a, a law in effect saying you can't rob banks. And frankly, I have not seen a major environmental problem solved without some message to the industry uh, to, to make these investments. Now, is that is that a fair characterization of your thinking on this? And I, I'd ask you to, to comment on that thinking. Um, th thank you. No, I, I, I'd have to say I don't believe it is a fair characterization. And the reason I say that is um, at the time of Waxman-Markey, we indicated that um, there were some tremendous uh, aspects to Waxman-Markey. 
great recognition of the role of coal. And as you have both pointed out, strong funding for clean coal technologies and a mechanism to help provide some of that funding. Um, but we had concerns that um, enabling uh, the technology of CCS to go forward without having solved the legal and regulatory framework around the property rights, injection of CO2, the long-term storage, um, as well as um, the, um, the, the aspect of hard caps until the technology and the time frame for that technology to be determined uh, left us to where we, we didn't believe that we could support the bill in its current form. And I think that's all that we ever said. We have always, you know, as I said earlier, we've, we've been working with Senator Bingerman for a number of years in terms of the original proposals that he had laid out for uh, improving our reductions in carbon and for a mm -hmm. carbon management program. It's just a matter of how all the components come together. We have concerns about the cost impacts. That's only natural. Um, and we had concerns that um, capturing all the CO2 without the ability to actually store it in the ground was a catch-22 that we could not see our way around. But I, I don't want anyone to believe that we don't feel that there needs to be carbon management programs going forward. Th thank you, Mr. Woods. Gentleman, the gentleman's time has expired. And to the gentleman from Arizona, uh, the gentleman from Washington State went over. That's and, the, and we will <coughs> note that as the gentleman I'll is uh, engaging in his questions. I'll do my best to give back the time he, he uh, took in going over. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses for your thoughtful testimony. I think these are complex issues that require uh, uh, thought and reflection. Uh, I want to start, uh, Mr. <coughs> Boyce, with you. Um, in uh, questions compounded or propounded by the chairman, uh, you indicated that with regard to the endangerment finding, you believe that given uh, some of the doubt now cast on the science uh, developed and relied upon by the IPCC and the University of, I can't pronounce it, uh, Anglia or whatever, uh, that you thought it was appropriate and your company felt it was appropriate for the EPA to take a step back and reassess that science. Is that a correct statement of your position? That is correct. I will tell you that given that, whatever burden we put on society based on this issue, we have to have, or at least I think we should have, public support for our position. I couldn't agree more that we should, in fact, step back and take a close look at that. Uh, the chairman cited the fact that uh, the uh, parliament in uh, England had found that there was nothing wrong with the science in its basic findings. Um, I guess I'm a little curious about that. Do you know how many years the IPC spent looking at science to reach its original conclusions? Uh, the IPCC has been in panel since uh, 1992 or the early 90s uh, with the original Rio treatment treaty. Uh, so they've been looking at this data uh, for a long period of time. So they've been looking at that data for from 1992 to 2010, we'll say roughly 18 years. Mm -hmm. And we now discover major flaws in it, uh, some of which they admit, including flaws about uh, the Himalayan glaciers disappearing by 2035. They acknowledge those flaws. They spent 18 years reaching the conclusions. We now discover the flaws. How long have we known about the flaws in the science? It hasn't been 18 years, has it? No, sir, it has not. How long do you suppose it's been? Uh, Closer to 18 months? Uh, not even that. In not fourth, even that. Fourth quarter of last year. Well, then I think your view that we should take some time and uh, look at that science again, given it took 18 years to develop it, it's now been cast in doubt. I don't think we can whitewash it in less than 18 months. So uh, I think that's a considered position. Um, I also want to uh, clarify a point you made earlier. I believe you said. Uh, that you, in fact, support CCS and CCS technology and all clean coal technology. Uh, you simply want a regulatory atmosphere in which that can be carried out and everybody can understand and follow the rules. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. As I said earlier, we have been involved, we're involved in a number of clean coal technology projects across the globe, China, Australia, here in the United States. And we just firmly believe that we have to understand the, de the time frame for deployment of the technology and the cost impacts to the economy of that technology deployment before we put the hard caps in place. 
Yeah, I, again, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I believe those costs will necessarily be passed on to the consuming public and to businesses in America which must compete around the globe. Uh, and I think looking at those cost factors and looking at issues like, okay, so we can capture it, we got that figured out, uh, where can we store it and can we store it legally? And it's, you know, I, I haven't seen anybody jump forward and say, gosh, I want it stored under my land. And we seem to have had a parallel issue in Nevada where we tried to store nuclear waste. And some people in Nevada seem to get upset. I think there's a United States Senator who's a little concerned about the storage of nuclear uh, waste uh, in that state. Seems to me storing carbon might be almost as complex as storing nuclear waste. Um, could you, can you elaborate for the committee, and this will be my last question, uh, the specific elements of legislation we could pass that would allow for the utilization of coal that was in fact clean and in which the carbon had been removed and we'd resolve some of those issues so that we could in fact stop any of the uncertainty that I think is now impinging upon the development of coal, coal energy in the United States. Well, I think as I indicate in my written comments and briefly alluded to in my verbal comments, uh, we've laid out a path for technology. Uh, I, I firmly believe that supercritical and ultra supercritical power stations that are carbon capture ready uh, as well as IGCC plants that are carbon capture ready should be enabled to be built today. Uh, we know with the work, for instance, that AEP is doing that we will have retrofit technology available for those plants. But in the meantime, we have a serious need for additional energy, as does the rest of the world. Um, and so that's the first step. And then these carbon de demonstrations, uh, future gen, we have been a founding member of FutureGen and like the committee have been very frustrated that we have not been able to get that project up and running yet, although we continue to work extremely hard at trying to find the rest of the funding for that project. It's a full scale plant, inject CO2 in the ground and store it. Those are the types of things that need to be done. And then once that happens, then we can put in place the time frames and the regulatory framework to say, this is the path and this is the ability of the U.S. economy and the global economy to absorb the cost of transforming our energy infrastructure. And you're willing to work with us on legislation to achieve those goals? Absolutely. Thank you very much. I yield back. Great. gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Salazar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Boyce, um, Senator Rockefeller and uh, Bonovich have proposed a phased-in technology incentive plan for CCS. Uh, that takes into account electricity production and industrial activities that produce CO2 and proposes incentives for CO2 development and deployment. Do you support that approach? Uh, the, we support the, the, the premises in that bill. Uh, we're still looking at the specific language, but, but basically the concepts of enabling that technology, providing the framework for it, and then getting that technology right first, we absolutely support. Mr. Lear? I would concur. I uh, certainly have spoken with uh, Senator Rockefeller on it, and, and again, we'd like to review the details a bit more, but when you look at the premise, uh, it's to us going the right direction. Mr. Kerry. Uh, Senator Voinovich, being from Ohio, we've worked very closely with him, and we are con still continuing to review it, but we like the premise. Mr. Cairo. Yes, we certainly support the rapid deployment of CCS technology. That's why we're investing tens of millions of dollars in it ourselves to build the plant in California. Okay. Well, I appreciate your comments, uh, and we'll do the. We'll start again with Mr. Boyce. Uh, how uncertain? How is uncertainty over carbon and climate change legislation in the U.S. Congress affecting uh, the build out of coal fuel uh, generation systems? Well, I think there's no question that we've got a, a basically a standstill in terms of new investments in the advanced technologies or current technologies for coal-fired power stations. Uh, we all know there's been a number of plants that have been put on the shelf or canceled uh, over, the, over the last year to two years because of the uncertainty around uh, where are we going with carbon management in the future. Um, as I said in my statement, I think we ought to enable ultra supercritical and supercritical power stations to move forward. Uh, they've got a footprint of uh, anywhere from 15 to 40 percent lower carbon intensity of the existing fleet of plants that we have today. It's a fabulous first step. Uh, and then we add the carbon capture and uh, storage technologies uh, when they become available. 
to those plans, which would be would be the preferred path. Mr. Lear. I would concur with uh, Mr. Boyce, and you know, when you look at the uncertainty, I, I think uh, I try to put myself in maybe some of our utility customers' uh, positions and think what would I would be doing. And, and there were very few uh, good things that came out of the recession, but one of them probably was that we had moved back our capacity needs three or four years. And given all of the, the uncertainty that surround this question and other questions, uh, and, and even if you look at, say, natural gas, uh, renewables, and, and where they might end up, my conclusion would be that I would stop building anything for a period of time and, and just sit there and wait for clarity to occur. My concern with that is that we will let that, that will happen, and then five, six, seven years from now, suddenly we will realize that the economy has, has started moving again, and hopefully in a dramatic fashion, and we will see reserve margins starting to diminish, and then we will be forced into taking panic positions uh, and, and really uneconomic, I'll call them, uh, uh, decisions because you just have to. And at the end of the day, American people do demand electricity, and they have every right to do so. Mr. Chiaro? I think there's no question that the lack of a long-term carbon framework has a chilling uh, effect on investment in, in coal-fired power generation. That's why we've been arguing for getting such a framework in place as soon as possible. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kerry, uh, you mentioned that uh, this legislation had provided only $10 billion for carbon sequestration. I think in your testimony, uh, the Chairman and Mr. Ensley say that the legislation provides $60 billion. Um, I just uh, I want clarification. Where do you get Mi your numbers, and where does Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman Salazar, I'd be more happy to provide that. If the, uh, gentleman, if the gentleman yeah. would yield, I uh, thank the gentleman. Yes, there is a ten billion dollars that is included as part of a wires uh, charge that is included to support research and development in carbon capture and sequestration. In addition, uh, the Waxman Markey bill provides fifty billion dollars additional for bonus allowances uh, for carbon capture and sequestration installed uh, in coal-fired plants uh, before 2025. So it's a grand total of approximately $60 billion for the coal industry uh, for the research, development, and deployment of carbon capture and, uh, and sequestration technology before 2025. So, Mr. Chairman, would that go specifically to research and development of CCS? That is correct. And, and deployment, the $50 billion uh, is, uh, is for deployment of carbon capture and sequestration technologies in coal plants in our country before 2025. Thank you, sir, for that clarification. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first off, I got here late. I'd like to... Uh, extend to offer my condolences to the victims' families of the mining disaster last week in West Virginia, and I look forward to an investigation into the disaster and learn what we can do to improve mining safety. Um, the, I have some questions for everyone. Um, if the United States were to cap greenhouse gas emissions without similar commitments from the devel developing nations, how much would that lower uh, total worldwide greenhouse gas emissions from burning coal? If we were the only ones that did it, no one else does it, is, that, is it significant? Well, the, the, the reality is we know that China has become the largest emitter of CO2, uh, and that doesn't even include the rest of the world outside of the U.S. So even with a cap here in the U.S., if nothing else was done, particularly in the developing countries, uh, the impacts would be negligible in terms of any impact uh, in terms of addressing rising levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. Again, uh, you know, we would concur with that conclusion. If you look at the developing world and the developed world, uh, CO2 emissions in Europe and, and uh, the U.S. Uh, essentially have flattened. I mean, they're, they're still growing slightly, but they have essentially flattened. Uh, the developing world is now emitting more CO2 than the developed world. So again, we come back to really my fundamental engineering premise. If we're going to address this problem, it is carbon capture and sequestration and we share it with the rest of the world through trade agreements, commercialization, whatever, however we get it there. But it's going to have to be cost-effective from their perspective. Mr. Chairman.
Chairman, Congressman, we would not simply be, there would not be a lessening, there would actually just be a displacing uh, uh, of the carbon dioxide emissions. And we simply look at what China and India is, what they will do over the course of the next 20 years, uh, the fact that their demand for coal, their demand for energy, the fact that they're bringing power plants online, the only people that would be affected by this uh, by this type of, uh, of legislation would be the American people, the people that are paying the electric bills every day. And go to point in fact, uh, Administrator Lisa Jackson actually admitted this, uh, I believe, in testimony before the EPW committee, as did Secretary Chu. So both are very aware that this type of legislation would do little to curb overall uh, worldwide CO2 numbers. I would agree that if the U.S. is the only nation that moves forward, uh, the effect on total emissions to the atmosphere would be small, single digit percentages. But I guess the bigger concern for me, having attended the U.S.-China Energy Summit last October in Beijing, is looking at what the Chinese are doing in all these alternative energy technologies. They're now leading the world in nuclear power plant construction, wind construction, solar construction, electric cars. They're moving ahead very quickly on these clean energy technologies, um, much more rapidly than the U.S., and I fear that the jobs that will be lost will be in the new energy technologies. So it would be extremely unwise for us to unilaterally enter into any kind of agreement without other developing nations being involved as well, and I agree with that. Um, another question, what, what foreseeable impact will the EPA's endangerment finding and pending regulation have on domestic coal industry, and how, how are you preparing for something like that? Well, I think, uh, as, as was mentioned earlier on the panel, um, you know, the, the, the Clean Air Act is a, is, is a blunt instrument. Um, and it's our view that it was never really designed to handle something like CO2. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're forced to go down an EPA regulatory path, the disruptions, not just to the coal industry, but to every facet of American industry and our daily lives is going to be significant uh, as uh, if EPA tries to regulate every emissions of CO2 in the country, which eventually they will have to under the Clean Air Act. Um, so that's a, that's a significant issue. I would like to also add one point on CCS and why it is so critical. Um, post-2020, to meet the targets in Waxman-Markey, natural gas uh, generating facilities will have to put CO2 capture and sequestration technologies on them. And so this technology is critical, not only for the coal industry, but for the gas, for, for fuel in general, uh, and that's why we are so strongly in favor of it. Um, again, uh, I concur with Mr. Boyce. Uh, uh, the EPA's uh, approach on this, I think, will create unintended consequences that are unimaginable as it, it works through the uh, economy. And we are focused very much on working with Congress to make sure that doesn't happen. I think Senator Rockefeller's uh, proposal and, and uh, Congressman Rahal's proposal to delay, step back and delay implementation two years is very sound as we really work through the system and, and work with Congress and all of industry to try to find a much better instrument to deal with uh, the issue as opposed to EPA handling it in a very blunt manner. Um, Mr. Chairman, Congressman, we are actually in litigation right now on the endangerment finding. We we have uh, we have very we have a lot of concerns with regards to the way the EPA came up with their data. Again, I mentioned it. Uh, they 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 talk about the IPCC study 48 times, and actually in the supporting documents, company documents, they reference it 395 times. So um, you know we have a lot of concern with that. But I also have to look at the fact that this the, the fact that the the, uh, the idea that you only you didn't have to find endangerment you may and you may, you may make a ruling it was completely up to the administration on this uh, if you look at what uh, administrator jackson actually said when she was in the epw committee uh, testifying on behalf of if le if legislation such as the carry boxer bill were to have passed would she still need to find this regulation and she answered yes so um, you know, we, we're very concerned with this, and, 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 and we're concerned about what that would do to the jobs. Again, we're talking about the elimination of thousands of hardworking coal mining jobs in areas of this country that don't need to be hurt economically any more than they are. This is about families. This is about small grandchildren. This is about people that are trying to provide for their families, and we are very concerned. 
we don't think the clean air act in the endangerment finding is the best approach to address the climate change issue which is why we are a member of the u s climate action partnership and support the principles that are largely embodied in h r twenty four fifty four thank you thank you gentlemen gentleman's time has expired and by the way the chair will recognize himself for another round of questions by the way that's the point the point that mr caro is making we're trying to create a legislative framework that is able to deal with the consequences of putting a cap on carbon that's our goal in the legislation and again it continues to be a little bit of a mystery to me in two thousand and nine there were no new coal fired plants ordered there were ten thousand new megawatts of wind installed in the united states five hundred new megawatts of solar two hundred new megawatts of geothermal two hundred new megawatts of biomass electrical generation installed in america ten thousand new megawatts of natural gas coal saw its percentage of total electrical generating capacity declined from forty nine percent down to forty four percent in two thousand and nine we have seen the rise in the price of coal anyway it's gone up sixty percent over the last five years coal costs have gone up that's with out any price on carbon this legislation that uh, we passed uh, through the house of representatives is intended on helping the coal industry uh... the legislation which senator rockefeller uh, uh... has introduced has eight hundred and fifty million dollars a year for the next ten years our bill has one million one billion dollars per year for the next ten years to do research uh, to do development but we add an additional fifty billion dollars for the coal industry which the rockefeller legislation does not have so we have a grand total of sixty billion dollars the rockefeller legislation has a grand total of ten billion dollars so this disparity goes right to the heart of the question of whether or not uh, we are in fact engaging here legislatively in an attempt to harm rather than help the industry we do believe there's an inexorable decline uh, we see it year after year in terms of the rise in the percentage of new electricity coming from natural gas coming from wind coming from solar coming from actual installation of new energy efficiency technologies and so i just think uh, mr carey that a lot of what you're engaging in here is, is uh, really just crocodile tears that you're shedding uh, for an industry that we are trying to help uh, because otherwise you're basically mirroring the whole path that the auto industry took they're in denial in terms of the the, the technology revolution that was taking place around it uh, the desire to help the industry to make the transition uh, and then blaming those who were trying to help Okay? And it's just a, a repetition of that over and over again. And all I ask is that there not continue to be a misrepresentation, Mr. Carey, uh, of what is in fact inside of the Waxman-Markey bill and additional modifications that could be made as part of negotiations with the coal industry, uh, with the utility industry, with natural gas and other industries as well. You know, that goes really to the heart of this whole issue what we're doing and uh, and my bottom line here uh, is that uh, we do believe that the coal miners of our country deserve a bridge to the future uh, and we're trying to provide that in the legislation trying to hold on to something that is not tenable is ultimately going to come to harm those families that's our own belief economically and the reason and we'll go back to mr. Chiaro's point the reason that we do believe that we have to fund carbon capture and sequestration is that we have to solve it for the rest of the world we have to develop a technology that can be used in china and in india that's our responsibility as a nation we are a technological giant we have the capacity to do this the companies who are at this table are investing in carbon capture and sequestration technology they are global companies so they know that this is moving towards them not only here but in other countries as well we're trying to provide the leadership and have the united states be first in its deployment so that's really what this debate is all about 
Okay? It's not whether or not we want to harm the coal industry. We don't. It's can we com make compatible the CO2 that is emitted from the coal industry with new technologies in a way that creates a bridge to the future. And if we don't, I think the pathway is inexorable, and that is down in terms of the amount of coal which is used in electricity generation in our country. As state after state passes renewable electricity standards, there will be a higher and higher percentage of electricity generated from those alternative sources. We've all read the headlines in just the last uh, a couple of months with uh, ExxonMobil purchasing uh, a, a, a basically unheard of small natural gas company, which along with six other natural gas companies have discovered enough natural gas in our own country to increase natural gas reserves by 30 percent. And all of this has occurred just in the last two years. So this pathway is one where we want to partner with the coal industry, you know, to create this new technology in partnership with you, okay? And again, I keep coming back to this uh, because we do not believe that this should be adversarial. We should try to partner in order to find a way to accomplish this goal to the mutual benefit of our country and the coal industry. Otherwise, I am, I am very much afraid uh, that the, there will be negative consequences uh, for the coal industry because of the development of alternative technologies in other electricity generating sectors in our country. And, uh, and so I just, I come back to use my five minutes to make that point. Uh, and again, to invite the industry to partner with us to solve the problem rather than continuing to engage in these kind of historical remain demand debates about whether or not the science is accurate or not. Um, it is, uh, but rather to really work as to how we can construct a technological pathway for the coal industry. If we do that, then it will be win-win. The Chair's time has expired again. Let me turn and recognize the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Capito. Trying to get the light on. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm going to respond to some of uh, some of your comments. Um, I wasn't really going to say anything, but I want to. I do want to say we have the, the top two um, largest coal-producing companies in our country. I did not hear. Actually, the three top. Three. Excuse me. Yeah. I I did not hear a pushback or a um, denial that CCS and increased technology and research is going to be. Um, a bridge to the future. I think they're fully engaged in this. They realize this is the bridge to the future and that this will continue to use our most abundant resource and keep people working. You mentioned that we've used less coal. So I, I think we, we have unanimous consent that this is the direction that we need to go. Um, you mentioned that less coal was, was, was used in 2009. We had a national recession. Many of our, uh, my own district, we lost Century Aluminum out of our district, which was the largest energy consumer in our entire s state, moved to, um, of all places, Iceland. I, I, uh, but, you know, that, that is an enormous hit across this nation in terms of why have we used less coal. Um, the other thing is you mentioned that no, no new coal plants or coal-fired plants had been developed. You know, this begs a whole nother issue, this whole permitting issue that we've been talking about. This is an, an, an area that um, is pervasive in this administration with the EPA and other regulatory uh, agencies uh, basically conducting an anti-war agenda and, and I think an anti-coal agenda, and I think that's part of what we're seeing with the lack of permitting. So I, I do think that we agree that CCS, I'm really proud that the first uh, experimental uh, AEP plan is in is in one of the second largest coal producing state in, in this country in in West Virginia. Um, the other thing that I think uh, Mr. Charo has brought up port sort of peripherally, it, it's a, but it's not the subject of this debate, is that or this uh, testimony is that the natural gas industry is going to have to also um, be at the forefront of this technology to be able to exist in in the existing plants that we have right now. And so I think. Um, you know, that we realize in a state like West Virginia, whose state economy is heavily reliant on coal, that, that we need to begin to transition and transition into more 
uh, advanced and more refined technologies to be able to use this. But at the same time, I've heard in the testimony, if we're going to ask for renewable standards, and, that, and that's great, but you're not calculating in, we're going to have a larger demand for all kinds of energy. Why wouldn't we consider putting C, uh, CCS or uh, carbon uh, sequestration as part of a renewable standard like they have in Pennsylvania? And I I'm not sure if it's in our West Virginia standard or, or, or it was put forth as a West Virginia standard. So these are kind of the questions that have come forth with me. And I think that, you know, w uh, acknowledging in your bill, while I didn't vote for it, that $60 billion, and also, Somebody says over here, well, you're saying you don't want $60 billion. Excuse me, the bill's over in the Senate. We haven't even passed this. It's not like anybody's turning their head down to $60 billion to try to invest in a technology that's going to keep people working, make sense economically. So we're just looking for common sense solutions. Let's look for a way to move forward. Maybe if we extend the deadlines out to where the technology can catch up to where we can meet admission standards. These are the kinds of things that I, I keep hearing. I don't hear a denial that this is not a direction that we need to uh, move as a nation. Maybe where we're, where we're in disagreement is how quickly and in how what kind of blunt instruments do we use to punish the middle part of our, uh, our, our uh, country that, or a state like West Virginia or the state in the middle, uh, in the middle where we're heavily reliant on fossil fuels to generate our energy. We want a common sense energy plan that has an all of the above solution that's going to meet these standards, move us towards cleaner air. And so that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady. The gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Enzel. Thank you. Just we haven't talked about what we did in the stimulus bill either, which was put $3.4 billion in to pursue uh, carbon sequestration technology, including $20 million for a company called Ramgen, which is pursuing a compression technology that can make CCS much more energy efficient by reducing compression costs. I just want to note that. I wanted to ask, um, um, well, I'll just ask Mr. Boyce, I guess. Um, well, let me ask Mr. Lear. I've already run out my quota with you, Mr. Boyce. Um, I want to ask about the economics of, of carbon emissions. Uh, Paul Krugman wrote a really interesting piece about the economics of carbon emissions, and I recommend it to anyone who's interested in the economics of this issue. And basically what he was arguing is that, you know, coal um, competes with other sources of energy. It competes with wind energy. It competes with hydroelectric energy. It competes with solar energy. Those three technologies don't put um, meaningful amounts of carbon dioxide. They do in part because you have to manufacture the stuff to make it, but certainly less than coal. Um, and yet, so they're competing. You're competing with these other, if I can just call them cleaner from a CO2 aspect technologies. And yet in the current state of the law, uh, we allow one industry, the coal industry, to put gigatons of a pollutant, carbon dioxide, into our atmosphere, which we all own jointly, in unlimited amounts at zero cost, and that is using up the limited carrying capacity of our atmosphere. And I think any economist would look at that and say that's an externality. You're using up, you're costing society something because you're using up our atmosphere's ability to absorb pollutants, but you're not paying anything for it. And there's absolutely no limitation today whatsoever. You could put as many gigatons as you want without compensating the public for that loss at all, nor is it regulated. Now, there's two ways to deal with that. One is to regulate the amount going in, or two, to impose some cost associated with that. And I guess I'd just ask you, from an, from an economic fairness standpoint, um, and realizing there's all kinds of issues about how to do this, Mr. Boyce, express some of the concerns about the existing bill. I guess, Mr. Lear, do you think it's fair for the coal industry to be able to impose this cost on the rest of the world and be able to put unlimited amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at zero cost from an economic standpoint? Do you think that's a good economic system? Well, Congressman, uh, you know, I appreciate what your question is, and there's always a, a uh, a large debate on externalities and, and what what the price they should be and and the the real cost, uh, but I think it's reflective also. And in, in your you're not addressing in your question at least the other side of the equation is that um, coal is the most competitive uh, fuel source typically in in most applications around the world other than hydro. 
uh, and then you can get into dams and the externalities there and, and uh, other questions. Um, and that low cost gets passed on to consumers. So uh, is there, can there be a price on carbon? Yes, there can be a price on carbon. And will that ultimately end up in, in consumers' cost of electricity, cost of products? Uh, yes. I mean, that's the system. Um, ultimately, that will be translated or the business will go out of business. I mean, th that can happen as well uh, today when you look at all of our uh, renewables, the way we are established in promoting renewables is to subsidize them heavil heavily to try to make them more competitive with fossil fuels. And that's okay. That's, you know, that's what we're gonna have to do with carbon capture and sequestration as well. So, uh, you know, in, in the premise is, is there, um, could there be a cost for carbon? Certainly. Will that cost ultimately end up in, in the price of electricity and the price of all goods and services in the U.S. or elsewhere in the world? Yes. So let me ask you uh, the experience we've had on, on, on uh, trying to d drive new technologies. When we needed a new technology to deal with sulfur dioxide, uh, which scenario occurred? Scenario A, the industry on its own devices went out and made an investment to develop the technologies to deal with acid rain and develop the technologies to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions? Or did scenario B take place that the U.S. Congress imposed some cap, if you will, on the amount of sulfur dioxide going out, create a price associated with that pollution, and the industry then, in response to that, developed the technologies to solve that problem? Which scenario occurred? Well, as you're well aware, the, the Congress did uh within the Clean Air Act, uh, both phase one and phase two, uh, tighten um, SO2 regulations and ultimately the technologies uh, advanced in, and were put in place. The issue with SO2 compared to carbon is SO2, in, frankly, was more regional in the U.S. CO2 is global. And, you know, the, the, the point here, and, and also at the time, I think, you, if we go back, and, and we're going back to the very beginning of my career, um, there were alternatives. The, you know, utilities could do an, an economic evaluation of m moving to low sulfur coal. Scrubber technologies were, did exist. They got advanced further as a result of, I think, the legislation, but they were in, in existence. If, if the and chair we just find ourselves earlier in the, in the technology curve at the moment. Chair, indulge me just one more question here, if, if I may. Do you really think the industry would have solved the acid rain problem by itself in the absence of a regulatory requirement that they do so? Do you think they would have voluntarily made those investments? L well, looking at it in retrospect? You know, in, yeah, I, one, I'm in the coal industry, you're really asking a utility question, but uh, I think the utilities would have started to address it. I think the legislation advanced it further. Thank you. Or faster. Thank you. I would point out we don't have a lot of time on this one either. <laughs> well, that's why carbon capture and sequestration is so critical. As is this bill. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and and while we have you here and uh, uh, and uh, and you are the experts in the field, perhaps we could just get brief comments from you on this. The the U.S. Mine Safety and Health Administration cited the Upper Big Branch Mine with 1,324 safety violations from 2005 to 2010. In March of this year alone, the mine was cited for 53 safety violations, including improper failure to ventilate the combustible gas methane. Is that a typical rate of violations for mines? And uh, can you give us your sense of what is needed in this mine safety area uh, in order to make sure that uh, we reduce the likelihood that other families will suffer what is now being uh, borne by those families in West Virginia. Mr. Chiaro. Well, uh, I'm a board member of Cloud Peak Energy, the former Rio Tinto um, division. And I'm happy to say that we have the best safety record uh, of, the of the mining industry um, at Cloud Peak. And Rio Tinto generally has a very good safety record. We we, we don't see the kind of level of violations that you're talking about at any of our mines. To be fair, our mines are in the Powder River Basin. They are open-cut mines. They tend to have a different set of hazards associated with them than the, the underground mines in the east. And so I would expect there to be some difference. Um, 
but I would have to say that, that if I saw that level of violations at one of my mines, I would be quite concerned. Thank you. Mr. Carey. As I mentioned in my uh, written testimony, Mr. Chairman, and also um, I, I believe in my oral, uh, the importance of mine safety is, is, is very critical to Ohio. Uh, anybody, I, I do want to give an anecdotal example just real quickly. Uh, I was driving in, and there's a barn that uh, on my way to the airport from my house in Ohio, and on that barn it says, every day is Earth Day to a farmer. And I can assure you that every day is Mine Safety Awareness Day to every coal operator and every coal miner that goes into the ground every day. The issues revolving around this tragedy, we do not know all of the answers yet. We do not know, I don't know the level to what the fines, the seriousness of the fines or the amount of fines or the size of the mine or any of that. It's not in Ohio. But I can assure you that it will be addressed. And we just have to keep those miners and their family in our prayers. Mr. Lear. You know, safety and environmental compliance are core assets, core values with ARCH. When we look at uh, violations, uh, we report them every, every week I get a report. If it's serious, I get it instantaneously. Uh, if you look at operations like ours that operate large deep mines, large surface mines across the entire United States, we would argue with our peers, and it's a bit different than the, the profile that uh, Mr. Or Preston talked about, was we really think we do lead the industry in, in overall safety um, performance, incident rates, lost time rates, and we set a standard that really our board doesn't even allow us to compare ourselves to the industry. We can only compare ourselves to ourselves. And last year was a record, the year before, beating the year before record. This year, uh, we're off to a record start. We'll see how the year finishes. Uh, we take it very seriously. The number of violations uh, that uh, have been reported, and I certainly haven't uh, verified those myself. And I think you have to look at the severity of the violations because within the, the framework of the coal industry, it is true that the big mines virtually every day are being inspected uh, by a state or federal inspector. And it, some violations are very, very serious, and some um, are really almost uh, a, a traffic ticket approach. And, and the key that I always preach to all of our employees is we take them all very seriously, but if there is a violation out there that has endangerment and, and really a, a major concern on safety, you better be on it before the inspector gets there, let alone when the inspector is there, and we will fix them immediately. Thank you, Mr. Lear. Mr. Boyce. Um, yeah, we, again, we feel like we're, with it, we're, we're partners with uh, both Steve and Preston in terms of trying to drive much better safety performance throughout our industry. Um, 2009 was the safest year in our 126th year history. And over the last three years, we've improved our safety performance over 40%. Um, and you know, we start every meeting within the company with a safety contact or a safety discussion, including our board meetings. Um, so it's an issue that we deal with on a daily basis. Uh, our safety vision is to be incident-free at all of our operations. And we run 29 operations between the US and Australia. Um, the, the issue of violations is one, we treat every violation uh, to look at and understand the underlying cause as to what occurred and why that violation was there uh, and what we can do to retro, uh, rectify the situation. Um, we had, uh, for, as an example, how seriously we take this, we had an operation in uh, Illinois several years ago where uh, we had uh, a, a high level of violations. As we looked, brought in the safety professionals in the company to look at that, we determined we could not continue to mine that operation safely, and we actually went through the decision to shut that operation down. We were fortunate to be able to move all of our employees to another operation in the area, um, but we had to then take the financial impact with the customers uh, to, to, to make that decision. Uh, it's just something that you have to do. We uh, have an obligation and we have a view. You know, I, I joined the industry in 1977, the passage of the initial uh, uh, safety act. Um, and when I joined the industry, um, accidents were uh, statistics. Uh, what we have tried to drive in the industry is every employee deserves the right to go home safe every day. 
and we're not going to be happy until that happens. And we look at those citations, we look at our safety statistics uh, very, very carefully every day. Thank you, Mr. Boyce, very much. Um, and uh, and we thank uh, our panelists uh, for their um, participation here today. Um, this issue of coal is right at the heart of the question of whether or not we are going to control um, uh, dangerous greenhouse gases while at the same time enhancing our national security and creating jobs here in the United States. Okay? That's our goal. Um, and uh, what I would uh, basically recommend uh, to the industry is that they do engage in the Senate uh, in their efforts right now to uh, find uh, a bridge to the future uh, for the coal industry. Uh, we believe that Wax from Markey is that bridge, but we also do not believe that it is in any ways not uh, capable of being improved. Uh, and so we would urge you to work uh, towards that goal. Um, there is an inevitability to there being a price placed on carbon. It's going to happen. Um, and so I think the better course, one not adopted by the auto industry, would be to try to start out where you're going to be forced to wind up anyway, uh, because ultimately there are partnerships here, constructive partnerships that we want to uh, uh, basically put together with the industry in order to achieve those goals. Uh, Mr. Boyce said earlier we should leave the science to the scientists, and we have a letter from uh, 18 scientific groups uh, scientific organizations saying observations throughout the world make it clear that climate change is occurring and rigorous scientific research demonstrates that the greenhouse gases emitted by human activities are the primary driver. So that's the world and, uh, and we should not be in denial but rather we should be engaging this. And we do believe that we can do so in a way that preserves coal mining jobs in our country. And working with you in partnership, making coal mining a safer industry, uh, we can do so for one that for the rest of this century continues to have coal as a central part uh, of our industrial sector. So we thank you for your participation. Uh, we want to work with you closely in these months ahead. Uh, and with that, this hearing is adjourned.